Y'all ready to get started? Yeah. Yes. Glory to God. So, um, what do y'all want to talk about? There you go. No, I already know what I want to talk about. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? <laughs> yes, you did. That's right. Right. For a month, right? Um, I was just thinking about Nick because I was just talking with Nick and I was going to tell you, but since we're in the group, I'll wait till later to tell you. Um, but I mentioned it a couple weeks ago. And um, the ancient Hebrews, right? One of the, the feasts, the festivals they studied um, or that they observed was a New Year's. But the New Year's wasn't like we think of a calendar year. They also had a calendar year celebration, right? But they had another celebration that they called a new year that was actually celebrating creation and celebrating that God created. And I brought that up because when we come in the new year, we tend to think about the new year and now what we are gonna do to make our life better than it was. Because, and really that whole thought process, do you know what it's born from? It's born from thinking of the old year and all the things that were wrong in your life are not right or not good in the old year lack lack and so then we resolve to change all the old so our mind is still filled with the old even though we say we're going into the new and even when we're celebrating the new year we subconsciously the reason why we're celebrating the new year is because we're happy that the old year is over <laughs> right? Because listen, the old year was filled with lots of troubles. But then our in our resolve, we don't realize it, we bring the old into the new with us. Yes. That's exactly right. And then we're still walking in the old and not walking in the new. And and to use some scriptural references, it's like trying to put old wine in new wineskin. And what happens when you try to put old wine or new wine into old wineskin? <laughs> the the wineskin bursts. And you lose the whole thing, right? You lose the wine and the skin. They both become wasted. And so I bring all that up so that in this new year, instead of bringing the old with us, we can take a page out of what God was trying to teach the Israelites, because that's what he's trying to teach all people. That's what he's trying to teach us. And so coming into the new year, I thought we should talk about because you had a feast or a celebration to be reminded of something right and so they were celebrating a creation or what would be a new creation the restoration of all things this is the day god created everything right and they were celebrating when there would be a new creation the restoration of all things that's what it was actually about so when we come into the new year we're not as the world is not understanding the gospel or what God is doing in the earth, or what he has done, or what he shall do, but we're the people of God. And when we come into the new year, man, we want our minds to be filled with the new creation. Yes. So that we walk in the new creation, instead of walking in the old creation. So that we walk in the new man, put on the new man, instead of walking in the old man. And we use the new year to remind ourselves of those things and to be stirred up about the fact that there is a new creation. And what does it mean that there's a new creation? Right? Because that's what we want to think about as we're going into the new year. If you want to resolve to do something as you go into the new year, resolve to have your mind filled with the fact that there's a new creation. And to think about what does it mean that there's a new creation? Right? Because what will happen is, is you'll find yourself walking in the new creation. You'll find yourself experiencing the life that gave birth to a new creation. And you'll find yourself being delivered from the angst and the pain and the tribulation and the torment and the, the tumultu tumultuousness. I don't know if that's a word. Gary will tell me if I made up a word. <laughs> I make up a lot of tumult. Yeah, that's the right word. Thank you. You'll find yourself not walking in that. But you'll find yourself walking in heaven while you're in the earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does the new creation mean to you guys? Right? What do you think of when you think of a new creation? And honestly, I mean, I have a lot to say, but I want to try to let <laughs> some of you guys think about it. Because listen, 
we we don't come to church to put in our time. Right. This isn't community service. <laughs> we, we, we come here to recite to ourselves the tenets of the faith. Yes. That we might find ourselves being clothed in the new man and walking in the newness of life. Well, I can speak to that uh, along the lines of an evolution of thought. Because when I first got saved in 93... This guy got like within inches of my space, face, you know, kind of invaded my personal space. And he, and he said, he had heard that I had gotten saved. He goes, man, it's great to be a new creation, huh? I was looking at him like, you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> like, this can't. Oh, yeah. It was like, it was in a bowling alley. I was like, I'm like <clears throat> get away from me. <laughs> okay, beer. So that was my first, yeah. that was my first yeah. introduction to the to the to the to the expression. Mm. And then when I went entered into churchianity, uh, I was taught that you're a new creation to walk in the work that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in. So find out what that work is and go to work. Oh, busy. Oh, yeah. That's what oh, that's what a new creation is. Yeah. Wow. A lot I'm talking old. about an evolution of thought. <laughs> yeah. here. Okay, but you know, I'm sure other people probably were taught the same thing. Yeah. And then uh, present day, having been exposed to the, uh, and y'all know how benef how how uh, I'm gonna say lucky, how beneficial it is to be yeah. in a place yeah. where you have food that is good for yes. you yeah. and not laced with poison. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. we eat well at this church. Yes. Uh, the new creation to me means that I am now. Uh, I now have eternal life and I'm immune to death. Mm. Mm. And uh, that persuasion uh, of where uh, life is found is also a persuasion of where life is not found. <laughs> and you don't have to go looking for love in all the wrong, wrong places. In fact, you don't have to go looking for love because mm. you have love. Right. And right. you do not yeah. lack love because you have love. <laughs> yeah. It's like if I lost my keys, I looked for them until I found them. But once I found my keys, I'm not looking for them anymore. I got them. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. <laughs> the author of Hebrews says this. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Mm. So in that we say a new creation, it's not just like fancy language. It's not supposed to be a cliche. It's not just a Bible thing. You're reading the Bible, and so now we say it. And the author of Hebrews kind of brings out what it's supposed to mean when we say a new creation. It makes the first creation old. And that which has been made old is decaying and waxing old and past, ready to vanish. And so as we say a new creation and think of a new creation, it's supposed to wash our conscience clean of the old creation. And to Thomas's point, and to pose this question for everybody, what is the old creation? What is the first creation that's now been made old and that there's a new creation? Well, you could say a lot of things about it, but the first creation is the creation that was made subject to death by Adam. By Adam, exactly. And so it's a creation that is perishing, that doesn't have life, that's filled with corruption and decay and death. How many of you like corruption and decay and death? None of us do. Guess what? Creation also doesn't like it. It says all creation is growing in and travail, longing for the day that mankind, the sons of God, are made manifested in glorified human flesh because they know they'll be glorified also. And so in that we say a new man. What is the old man? Right? Because the old man is supposed to be washed from our conscience by the preaching of the gospel. Right? That man is supposed to be cleansed from our thought processes. So we no longer walk in the steps of the old man or no longer find ourselves being suited with the clothing that is the old man. Right? So who, who is the old man? At them that are looking for life through the world, that through the created things instead of the creator. But when you come to know the creator and the creator is your life, all of a sudden, you have the life that you have been searching for your whole life. The whole world is searching for something, for a new creation, for a new life, something that 
will endure unto the end. Mm. And, and, and that is, uh, is like a wonderful, youthful life. And that's what the new creation is all about because, you know, you receive that life and two days later, it's not two days old. That, that life is continually new. And so when you're walking in eternity, in, in, in his life, a life that will never end, that life you can feel is sufficient for you always. Mm. Mm. Do you guys hear what Maurice pointed out there? The old man is a, a man or a person, has nothing to do with gender, it's a human, that is looking for a life that endures right. to the end. Yes. That is longing for a life <laughs> that can't be corrupted, that can't be stolen from. A life that is so much that it can't be added to or taken away from. Mm -hmm. A life that withstands all things, that believes all things, that hopes all things. Right? The old man is a man that's been clothed in death. He's been clothed in death. And he's being tormented by the death that he sees. And because he doesn't see God there with him to clothe him with an incorruptible life, he's busy trying to gather life to himself. Yeah. Right. right? Like the first man, Adam. Right. He's called the first man, Adam. Well, in that there's a new man, it makes the first man old and ready to pass away. Well, the first man, Adam, what was he trying to do? Clothe himself. Oh. Why was he trying to clothe himself? It's not just about being naked, right? Like we could all say, well, we don't like being naked, so we try to clothe ourselves. But there was a deeper significance there that was being used by this picture, right? And so the old man is a man who sees himself clothed in death, who sees himself having a corruptible life, a life that can be stolen from, a life that can decay, a life that can perish. And because his mind is filled with the life that's perishing, he's all the time looking for a life that can endure to the end. And he's all the time trying to gather that life to himself. Right. So in that we say there's a new man, it's supposed to do something in our conscience. <laughs> where it washes our conscience clean from that kind of a man that can die. Yeah. <clears throat> where we're no longer seeing ourselves as that kind of a man. Like Thomas said, once I find my keys, I'm no longer looking for my keys anymore. Right? Yeah. Becky and I, we, we, we had this Ultima. Becky loves the Ultimas. The 3.5 SR. <laughs> to be specific. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, because the, the, the 2.5 does not go fast. Right? And Becky comes from a, a family that likes to race cars. Right? And so that 3.5 SR Altima will really get up and go. Like, it will really get up and go. Well, she got in a car accident, and they the, the, the car could have been repaired, but they totaled it out because the repair was more than the cost of the car. Well, man, that really bothered us. It bo she loves that car. We don't really have money to buy another car. And they weren't giving us money that we could buy the same car. Right? So our minds were filled with that old car. And I'm telling you, it was causing us pain. It, it was. It was causing us pain. We can't find a car. We're looking around. We're feeling the anxiety of not having what we need for life. Because our old car is destroyed. Yeah. Right? And all we can think about is how we want that car back. And we're even trying to hold on to that car. Right? We're like trying to figure out, well, you'll give us 6700 if we keep the car? Well, we'll fix the car and we'll keep the car. But then we find out all the trouble we got to go through to get the title cleared. Right? And even then it will still show like salvaged car or something. So that wouldn't work. So this tormented us. And so our minds were filled with the old car. Right? And it was filled with what we needed in the car. But then we found a car. And you know, I went down there that day with Matt, and I got the car. Is it an Ultima 3.5? It is. <laughs> SR. SR. Yes, SR. Now listen, that old Ultima we had was banged up. It had tenant windows, and the tent went bad. So I scraped off the tenant windows with my own thing. I didn't do a good job. <laughs> Becky had cracked the, 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 the front of the car. It was cracked. The back of the car was, was wrecked. The The... The paint was peeling off the, the, the hood of the car. This new car we got, none of that's going on. Rainwater would get in the window, and you have to like open up the, the, the door at the bottom to let the water leak out. I mean, this thing was a disaster. But it was fast, though. It was fast. <laughs> it was an SR. I'm 
feel the need, the need for speed. But anyway, do you guys think that we're thinking of that old car now? No. That wrecked? Do you think we're even contemplating it? No. Why not? Because you got the, the new, new car. Because we got the new car. But you haven't mentioned the most important thing. What color is that? It's silver. <laughs> That's a good one. It's, it's yeah, so yeah. Like and the paint isn't all peeling off. Yeah, right. And none of it's broken. And so do you see what I'm talking about? That old car has passed away in that we say the new car. Right. Yeah. Right? And now our conscience is filled with the new car, not the old car. And you know what's been removed from us? The torment and the angst and the pain of the old car. Even when we had the old car before it was wrecked, it was like breaking down. We just spent $3,000 on that car to get it fixed. And there was still something going on in the engine that wasn't right. And every time I got in and turned that car on, I could hear that thing in the engine. And I could know, we're about to have to fork out another few thousand dollars. You see how my mind was filled with this car that was corrupted yeah. and it was constantly yeah. being corruptible? Yeah. But then when there was a new car, my mind has been washed clean from the car that was corrupted and broken and could be broken, right? Yeah. And I use all that to describe what a new creation and what a new man is supposed to do for us. And we're, sub we're, we're meant to find our lives built upon that revelation so that our conscience can be continuously washed clean from the old man. Right. from the old creation and so that we could no longer have fellowship with the man and with the creation that's decaying and perishing and able to be subjected to death yeah. and so that we would have intimacy with the new man and the new creation that has a life that is not subjected to death or decay yeah. that has a life that can't be stolen from there is a new creation that God has gotten busy making. And we see the chief of that creation. We see that which God put into the earth to bring forth that new creation in the man, Jesus Christ. Because we see him having been raised up out of the grave in an incorruptible body. He's not a ghost. He has a body. He said, touch me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. He's got an incorruptible body. And do you know what he's declaring? He's declaring a new creation. Yeah. He's declaring a new man. So that we could begin to see what God has done through this man, Jesus. And we could start to see the new man and the new creation. And we could start talking about the new man and the new creation. And do you know that what that will do for us as we talk about this? It will make the first creation old. <laughs> and that which is made old is decaying and ready to vanish away. Yep. Not just vanish away in reality, it will, and it is vanishing away, but in our conscience, right? Because most of us, we're walking around in this creation, and this creation is still ministering to us, and we're still seeing death, and we're still seeing the corruptible things of this world, yes. and those things are trying to clothe us yes. with the old man. Those things are constantly, I say clothed, but rather unclothed. Because the old man is the man whose nakedness was revealed. Right. Yeah. right? And the new creation is meant to cause those things to start passing away from our conscience. That's why Paul would say, put on the new man. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why Paul would also say, neither circumcision or uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creature. Yeah. Right? A new creature. Mm -hmm. See, we've kind of gotten it twisted because we thought the old man is the man God doesn't like. Yes, that's right. We haven't defined the old man as a man who was dying and needed to be saved from death. We've defined the old man as a man that's a very bad boy who's made God very upset. And now because God's so upset, he's got to punish. That's how we've described the old man. So our thoughts of the new man are just, well, thank God he doesn't want to punish us anymore. I've been delivered from the punishment of God. You see how in that language, there is no connotation to, I've been delivered from death? And if I've been delivered from death, who's the one who delivered me? God. And if he has delivered me, what does it tell me about what he thought about me even when I was dead in sin? Because if he was so unhappy with me and filled with such a desire to punish me when I was dying... He could have just let me die. Yep. <laughs> he could have just let death have its way, its way. Right. and be done with it. 
But he didn't. And so much of, of the Christianity has, has been infiltrated with unfortunate ways of describing the gospel. And it's not to describe the different factions. It's not to despise the different factions of Christianity. It's that the word that the church is supposed to be built on can be made straight. So all of us can actually enjoy the life that is found in the new creation. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And so if all you're thinking about the new man is that God's not mad at me anymore. Well, how does that save you from the death you still see all around yeah. you? You're still the old it actually man. leaves you in it. It leaves yeah. you in it. Exactly. And it actually leaves you living like the old man, Adam. Yep. Do you think that Adam was still living like the man who was naked after God came and clothed him with the lamb? Because that's a picture of the new creation. And so there's Adam naked. There's Adam thinking he, he, his life is perishing. And he doesn't want to perish. And so now he's trying to clothe himself. He's trying to heap life unto himself. But then God comes and clothes him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The new. God's prophesying of the new. Right. He's prophesying of how I will clothe you in life. You are not alone, Adam. I have not left you alone to die. I'd rather die myself than leave you to die. The thought of you dying in outer darkness rents me in the deepest part of my being. Right? And they close him in the skin, the lamb skin, which is prophesying of the lamb God would provide to remove the death that was reigning over the world. Right? It's prophesying of the Christ, the Alpha and Omega, that would come into the earth to make a new creation. Not a forsaking of the first creation, but an entering into the death that was reigning over the first creation so that he could come out of that death, free from it, and bring the creation with him. Yeah. You know, Paul says, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That term comes from the way that uh, the Romans would punish certain people. They would take a dead corpse and they would bind it to somebody. That's redundant, that corpse. So that... that <laughs> well, <laughs> thank God for all the literary... Overruled. I couldn't help myself. Yeah. I'm sorry. He's talking Don't like a Hebrew. Shah, shah. Yeah. 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 Poor yeah. emphasis yeah. all the time. Yeah. But, but the corruption yeah. Yeah. and the death in that body would eventually overcome the person that they're punishing, Ooh. and it would bring them to death. Ooh. But as a new creation, and that's where that term, who shall deliver me from this body of death, that's where that comes from. Oh, wow. That's good. Well, the new creation is where now I'm busy with a life that's braided together with God, so that not only do I have life, I'm actually, the life that's in me is preserving that mm. corpse and eventually, when the end comes, it'll even bring it to life. Mm-hmm. That's good. Mm-hmm. So instead of death yeah. affecting me, I affect death. That's Amen. Good. That's a good picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's awesome. You see? Yeah. 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 And, and part of the it's not that we're we're bad people or bad Christians. We haven't been taught the gospel in a way that highlights these things. Right. For instance. Yeah. The cross is a big picture of God doing this. But we made the cross about how God was so dissatisfied with man. Look what he did to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so now our thoughts are filled with guilt and shame. Where actually the cross is supposed to be the place where you're filled with the knowing that God's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to come and stand with you. He's not ashamed to call you his own. The cross is supposed to minister that to you. But Mm -hmm. it's been taught in the body of Christ as if that's the father punishing the son because he's ashamed of us. Jesus is God. And do you know when God said, let there be light? Do you know what God was doing? He was releasing out of himself the Son. And he was sowing his seed into creation. And what was going on in creation when he sowed his seed into creation? Darkness and chaos was upon the face of the deep. And then he sowed his seed, which is the Christ, which is Alpha and Omega, which is his incorruptible life, which is the Son. He sowed his seed into that darkness to do what? Bring forth life. Now the cross. What does it say about that was permeating there? Darkness. It says unless a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. 
So there's God. He's the sower. There he is sowing his seed all over again. Who is his seed? Jesus, his son. The son is his seed. Who is the son? The son is the very resurrection, eternal life of the father. And now the cross is God sowing his seed into the darkness and the chaos. The cross is God all over again saying, let there be light. Yes. The cross is God creating. It is God making a new creation. Yeah. And the only way he could make a new creation, which is to bring creation out of death, is if he went and joined himself to the death. And so the cross is him joining himself to the darkness and the chaos. He sowed his seed right into the darkness and the chaos so that he wouldn't abide alone. Unless the seed fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. He didn't want to abide alone. But his creation is perishing. So what is he going to do? He's going to sow his seed into the midst of the darkness of that creation. Let there be light. Mm -hmm. And now here is Alpha and Omega. That's Alpha and Omega on the cross. There's Alpha and Omega entering into his death-torn creation, knowing that inside of this body that can be torn is a life that can't be torn that can't be held by death. So that in him entering into a creation that's perishing, possessing a life that can't perish, he would come out of corruption. He wouldn't see corruption, actually. He would come out of the grave, and in him coming out of the grave, he becomes the chief of a new creation that can't perish, that has been brought out of the pangs of death also. And now we have fellowship with that. And we talk about that and encourage each other with that, right? Yeah. And now, this is why the early church rejoiced in the cross. Mm. Because if you think the cross is a place where the Father is so angry, he's beating, you ain't coming there. Right. And in fact, you don't want to think about it no more. How many <laughs> of you like to stand in a place where you feel guilt and shame? Do you realize human beings will fight to the death to avoid feeling guilt and shame? Do you realize it's actually contrary to us? Yeah. We were never meant to feel those emotions, and in the day we feel them, do you know there's something inside of us telling us this isn't right? This isn't born from life? And we want to get away from it? And so the serpent got it right to come and define the cross, the place of beauty, the place of creator, creating, by bringing his first creation that he loved, that he loved so much he would never let him die. It's the creator entering into the pain and the angst and the torment of his creation so that in absorbing it into himself, he could bring them out of it mm -hmm. and demonstrate a new creation, mm -hmm. right? And now we don't just see the cross and God saying, let there be light. We see the light. <laughs> we see the resurrection. We see a creation that conquered death, yeah. that's been brought out of death. And we see in the man Jesus the certainty of what we will be. And we see the life we have now. Even in this earthen vessel, we see it in Jesus now. And we see what type of creation awaits us. We see an earth where there is no sin and death that is ours. Mm. It's not going to be ours. It's ours now. Mm, right. And we look to that. And that continuously washes our conscience clean from this creation that's perishing. And it saves us from the torment we feel as we look around and see all the things that aren't right. Mm. Because I promise you, there's no fear and torment in God. Right. So in the day you're looking around at this creation, you're filled with fear and torment, it means your mind is filled with the old instead of the new. And what it means is, is you're trying to put new wine in old wineskins. And so now the old wineskin has burst and you've lost the skin and the wine. Right? And that's what New Year's. Sure, we can have our worldly celebration where we're like, hallelujah, 2024. I'm not telling you, you got to get rid of that. But in that, we're born from above. And we're not ignorant. Let us also, as we walk in this new year, let our minds be filled with the new creation, the new man. <laughs> let our resolve be to talk to one another about that, to remind one another about that, to encourage one another about that, to daydream with God about that, right? So that the old, the old man and the old creation can continuously be purged from our thinking 
Because we need that every day. Uh, yeah. Sufficient for each day is the evil thereof. Yeah. The scripture says, you know what we all going to wake up tomorrow and see somewhere in the world? Evil. What's going to save us from that? The mercies that are new every morning. The mercies that are new every morning. And those mercies are contained in the work of God to bring forth a new creation. And to make a new man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A man that is not created in the image of the body of death or corruptible flesh, but a man that's been renewed after the image of the knowledge of God. Yes. Which is we see the man Jesus, and he isn't just in the image of God, but the man Jesus has now inherited the likeness of God inside of human flesh. Mm -hmm. Immortality in the body. A physical body that can't die, that can't ever feel weak, that never feels any more aches and pains. Listen, by most accounts, I'm still a young guy. I'm 47 years old. I can't even get up out of bed without <laughs> moaning and groaning. And it's, it's, it's funny. I, I mean, it's even gotten to the point where I said, I don't have to do that. And so I even made a point. I'm going to stop doing that. And you know what I'm still doing? Every time I stand up, groaning. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> And, 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 and not just in, in, in this earthly realm. It, it actually has a spiritual connection. It says all creation is groaning and travail. It's yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. So even as we're groaning, we're groaning. And that's what I started being reminded of. This groaning is me looking forward to the body. Yeah. Right? That I will be clothed in. That I will be raised up in. That will never feel weakness again. And so instead of thinking, and it's a, a symptom of the old being washed from you. Every time I groan, I'm not thinking about the body that's dying. Every time I've grown, I'm thinking about the body that can never die. That's going to be mine in, in the resurrection. Right? Yes. And so now I'm thinking of that as I grow. That's right. And you can even feel happy as you're growing. <laughs> so it helps. It's, no, it does. That's why it's so funny what he said. It actually does help spiritually. It doesn't say creation is groaning, not knowing. It says creation is groaning, knowing that yes. when the sons of God are manifested, they will be delivered once for all time from the corruption. So they're looking forward, groaning. It's like when a woman groans in childbirth. She's not groaning thinking that life ain't coming forth. She's groaning because she knows life is coming forth. And it's difficult to be pregnant with life and for that life to come forth. But even as you're groaning in labor, you're groaning because life is coming forth. The groaning isn't a sign you're dying. The groaning is a sign of life coming forth. Amen. I have a word of encouragement for those who are hearing you right now and don't really fully understand. Anybody like that? Maybe, maybe on the video. Uh, you, you, uh, understanding is not a prerequisite to the truth working in you. Oh, man. That's true. That's good. Understanding is actually a side effect of the truth working in you. Yep, there you yeah. go. It's like uh, my son Nick killed a girl he was dating at, in college. Uh, you don't have to understand for the truth to work in you. Okay? We just have to be exposed to the truth. Yeah. We just have to behold Jesus, the truth, and then the truth will do the work in us. Yeah. And so uh, the, the, the intellectual ma ma man, woman, that we want to understand. <laughs> and we're taught, you know, subliminally, I think, uh, don't, don't believe until you understand. Well, if that's yeah. true, then you ain't ever going to believe. Right. Mm -hmm. Double that's negative true. emphasis. So... <laughs> <laughs> don't be discouraged if you don't understand. Just trust that uh, there's something going on in you. It's like a, you know, nutrition. If you eat good food, you don't know everything that's happening in your body is the good food's doing something in your body for you. Mm -hmm. But then later, you feel, oh, I feel pretty good. Why? Wow, you've been eating well. <laughs> that's why, you know, people, a lot of people, a lot of churches may not fully understand the gospel the way it was really meant to be communicated but they've heard the gospel in a sense in a sense enough to know the lord and be saved but they don't the, the clarity of the truth hasn't hasn't come to them yet mm -hmm. but god is faithful and he will bring to light that which is in the darkness in in your own heart and will bring that to light. That's why the proclamation of the truth is so important. 
And understanding is important, but it is not a prerequisite, like you were saying, mm -hmm. to like, you don't have to know everything to be saved. But God desires you to know everything. Mm -hmm. He yeah. is in the business of shedding light on that which is in the darkness that we might know the truth and be built up in the truth in fellowship in the truth and with the truth so that 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 <clears throat> life that was given to us might manifest really deeply inside of us and and the, so he so it, it's good to come into an understanding but you don't have to know everything yeah. immediately. Right. And not everybody is going to know everything right. immediately. No, no. But listen, I will say this. Go ahead, Joe. Um, I was going to say kind of in regards to what you're saying, I think sometimes it can be hard to, um, or you said the understanding, you just have to believe. I think to even no, get I, to I did, I didn't Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess. I, I said understanding is not a prerequisite. Uh, to know truth, the truth. For truth to work in you. Okay. Yeah. I think I didn't with, say just believe. Right. I'm sorry. Because I, I didn't that's mean what that. Buddha and Muhammad and everybody else might preach. Just believe. Right. Well, believe in what? A lie? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, what I was trying to get at is, I think, to get to that point, the you have to put yourself in a sense of vulnerability and humility. And I think that is where the barrier even has to begin is because I think it's, for some people, I think it's almost unfathomable to think that somebody just loves me right now mm -hmm. and yeah. kind of like what you said earlier um you're uh being loved in your most uh you think is you're you're horrible you're you're, low you're a bad person you're low you're low in the totem pole but to to understand or to think that wow there's actually somebody that loves me and i'm in my most horrible spot yeah you know i'm digging my own grave here but there's somebody that's right above me that's saying hey man what are you doing like uh, why are you doing this? Like, I want to be here with you. I want that, you to... That better yet, sorry to interrupt, there's yeah. someone who's in the grave with you. Yeah. True. Oh. Very true. Who's going to take you out of it. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I think there's, uh, like I said, there's a... I don't think people are are open to the vulnerability and humility that's involved with that. I think they mm -hmm. just they just think it's like, that's insane to think that somebody's in the grave with me. Like, that's... Mm -hmm. There's no way that's even possible. Right. But even that vulnerability and humility is not a blind thing. You have to see something that causes you to, mm -hmm. to be willing to be humble and to be willing to be vulnerable. Because yeah. you won't just do that. No. You know, when you brought up your first question about what is the old man, I mean, I, I, I was like, that's me when I'm not at rest. Mm -hmm. You know, that yeah. that is me. That's a symptom of the old man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's whatever version of death that I'm dealing with, I'm, Toward I'm yeah, I am after it. And to the same extent, when it comes to uncovering a, or, or understanding a truth that's being worked in me, yeah, my mind will be a wreck if I'm trying to grasp it and understand it. But, but what I know turns it all around for me is, is coming to that place where it's like, God's with me in this crap. God, you know, it, it, it's, it's, and he does love me. I mean, I think that's the gospel that that isn't spoken enough. But what does it mean that God's with you in this crap and God loves you in this crap? Because I dwelled there for a long time. And you know what? That didn't help me feel any better. All I was was a guy who's dying who's loved. And so how does that help me while I'm in the crap? I, I agree with that statement, but I, for the sake of the group in no. the video... How does it help me to know God? Well, let's, it, let's it helps, say it like it this. Helps me, it, it helps me. Well, hold on. Let I, me put it this way. All right. Would it help you if you knew I was with you in your crap and I loved you? Yeah, it would. Because, you might feel better, but would it help you? No, it would help me because I would think I have hope. Greg's going to help me. Okay, well, that, that, that that's why I asked the question because that's a problem. I can't raise you up out of the grave. No, you couldn't. But, so my love for okay. you and me being with you in your crap? Yeah. I don't have anything in myself that's greater than the crap. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Right. And so what you're saying is absolutely true. And I know you know this, but for the sake of the no, video, no, no. We, we have to make a connection that the reason why it matters that God's with me in the crap and that God loves me in the crap, it's from the beginning. It's what the whole scriptures okay. declare from the beginning. No. We miss the whole point of God revealing himself. 
in me is a life that can't be conquered by crap. Um. <laughs> right? Well, what do we need when we're in the crap? Because I'm telling you, I got to the place where I was in the crap. I knew I was beautiful to God. I knew he loved me, but I'm still dying. Uh, and I never made the connection that the reason why it matters he's with me and that he loves me is because he's got a life that can't die. Uh, and now what happens is, and that's why we're talking about the new creation, uh, and everything Thomas said is true, and everything Joe said is true, and uh, that Phil said is true. But listen, man, it's sad that we don't understand, we can't even talk about the new creation without understanding. Yeah. That's like the most basic pillar of Christianity. Right. Right? That we can't even see that when we're in the crap, the reason why the new creation is important is because it shows us a life that's greater than the crap. Yeah. Uh, that has already overcome <laughs> the darkness and the death. And so we see God with us. The reason we know he loves us is because he has drawn near to us to give us this life that's greater than the death. So now we, when we connect with God, we're not just connecting with God, the person. Like there's God. But God has attributes. He has characteristics. And what is the attribute of the characteristic that we see in the face of God? God, the only immortal. Immortality. We see shining in his face. Mm. We see an incorruptible life shining in his face. And now that incorruptible life starts overshadowing the death that I'm in that's trying to take me from rest. Mm. So I'm not just like, hey, Sarah, hey, Sarah, who cares? I'm in this death. One day I won't be. A... What I'm doing immediately is I'm talking with God about the life he has in himself. And I'm talking with him about what it means that he has given me that life. And I'm talking with him about what that life does to the hell I see in my life. And now my imagination becomes captivated by a light that swallows darkness. Yes. And now I'm not seeing darkness. I'm seeing a light that encompasses all darkness. And that puts my flesh to rest. Right? Yeah. And so there's one thing to say, I don't understand. But it's another thing to say, I don't understand and just walk away. Because you don't really want to understand it. Yeah. And I think if you don't understand, you should ask yourself, and I have to ask myself this, do I even want to understand? Hmm. I mean, Esau didn't understand. And it doesn't say it was because it was innocent. He didn't really want to understand. No, he didn't. No desire. He had no desire to understand it no. because he wanted the old creation. Yes. Yeah. So don't come talking to me about a new creation because I want the old. Uh -huh. That's not <clears throat> not understanding. That's rejecting. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the, those are the people who love the darkness. Those are the people who love the darkness. Yeah. And they don't that's do silver. it. They don't do it. No, they don't do it maliciously. It's that... Deceived. They want the life that's in the earth, uh -huh. and they won't let it go. Uh -huh. They won't look at that life and say, it's dung. Mm -hmm. No, they want the dung to be made perfect. <laughs> they want the life of God through the things in the earth. And so their heart, you could have a person doing it innocently. A person, There could be a person sensitive in the heart that feels great pain at thinking they can't get the good from the world. And the pain they feel at that thought could be so much that they, they harden their heart, right? No, no, no. Hear no evil, see no evil, think no evil, right? Mm. And it's not them uh, maliciously not wanting to understand, but they're still trying to keep themselves from pain. And they're still trying to find life and the good they can see go right for them in the world. And we all want good things to happen for us in the world. None of us are like, hallelujah, let all the bad happen. <laughs> But the reality is, is that the life we can gain from the world is as dumb. And it doesn't begin with, well, i got to now pretend like I don't care. It begins with, like it began with me, Lord, I don't know how I can feel peace when everything's going wrong around me. But I believe that the world can't give me peace even should I get everything to go right. And you be, that's the beginning of understanding. Now, he sorts out the strength to walk out the truth, yeah. right? But you have to first start accepting what the truth is. And if people don't understand, for people watching on the video, if you don't think you understand and you actually desire to understand, then you start asking questions mm -hmm. about it's, what does that mean? It's kind of like um, I was listening to Annette's message, uh, Let There Be Light, and what she said about giving God time really like resonated. It's like if you give him the time, like what you receive 
is tenfold. You know, like it's just like, but it's opening yourself up and sitting at his feet. Yeah. And it's not like making it a religious obligation, but like you need to need him at that place where he can shed light. On, I mean, and he, it, it doesn't have to look a certain way, but I loved how she, just that simple statement yeah. really stuck with me. And it's like the parable of the sower sowing the seed, mm -hmm. right? Like when you plant a seed in the ground, can you see it working? No. <laughs> Especially on. No, you, you. Well, what if you went out there and dug it up every day? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do and what if because you didn't see it working, you, I don't understand it's not working. Right? <laughs> and so you stop sowing seed. We trust. Right, and that's that's a, it's a it's a natural example though of what happens with the word, which is the seed, right? And what the world tries to do to the seed in our hearts. It tries to get us to walk away from the beholding of the word of life. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways it tries to get us to walk away is, oh, you don't understand. Well, you don't see any results yet. You don't see any results. Yeah. I don't understand. And then you walk away instead of purposing to continue to hear. God told me things that I didn't understand how they could be true. I heard the words. I understood what those English words meant, but I didn't understand how it could be true. Right. Mm. And And I kept wrestling with it. Don't, well, the only good part about not understanding is that it says something to you that you don't understand. Yeah. And if you don't understand something, a wise human being is going to ask God, reveal this thing to me. Help me mm. to understand this. Or to have ask questions in the group. Absolutely. Like I asked God questions. When God told me, listen, when God first revealed that that's Jesus on the cross in Psalm 23, and he says, I lack nothing. Listen, man, I did not understand that. And that doesn't mean I didn't read the words and know what the words meant. I didn't understand how a dude stripped naked, beat to death, and nailed to a tree could say he lacked nothing. Right. And you know what I told him? I don't understand how that could be true. And I kept telling him. And do you know, as I kept engaging with him about that which I didn't understand, as I kept asking questions about all the things I thought contradicted that, he brought clarity and understanding, right? The worst thing that you could have happen to you if you're struggling to understand how it all fits together, right, is to just walk away. Because that's the enemy telling you, you don't understand, it can't do anything for you, mm. right? But to Thomas's point, it's not a prerequisite to understand for the truth to work in you. Mm. But, yeah, that's good. I'll, but we all say, but when someone says but, what comes after is what they wrote. But if you don't, subject yourself to the hearing of the truth or you don't make yourself available to hear the truth and then to engage with it and to question mm -hmm. then how is it that you're going to gain understanding right. yeah right. I, I fully agree with what you just said I, I, the thing i would emphasize is um there are people who would conclude there's something wrong with me because i don't understand yeah. and that's what i'm more speaking to yeah, yeah. uh like Callie said, just give God time. Just keep exposing your heart to the truth. Yeah. And we can all look back at something that at one point we didn't understand. Now we understand that we're at peace. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, but if you have to, Lisa, I don't want to put her on the spot. She struggled with that a lot. She said, I don't, I don't, I don't understand Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you don't ask questions. Like, hit me up on the phone. Come over, Greg. I want to grill you about what you said. <laughs> and I want to ask you what the... And you can even be emphatic. I'll be emphatic with you. You can say, what the H-E-L-L -L are you talking about? That's not yes. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to, listen, to, 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 to Thomas's point, the, the guy in the parable of the sower sowing the seed, he didn't necessarily understand how it worked itself out. Right. Because it says he went to bed day and night, day yeah. and night, and then he woke up one day with a big crop, yet he knew not how. Yeah. Right. right? And so all he knew was that the <laughs> sower sowed the seed, right? <laughs> and so he kept, you know, thinking of the seed that the sower sowed. Uh, the sower has sowed a seed. What is the seed that the sower sowed? Right? <laughs> Even he can walk around with all of his questions, right? And, and asking questions, I'm telling you, revelation is coming. And so I guess my only point is, and it, it piggybacks on what Thomas said, don't, if you struggle to understand, don't let the enemy <coughs> come and tell you, you don't understand, and therefore there's no value in hearing. Mm -hmm. Because now he's trying to lead you away from the seed that the sower has sowed. 
right? There's no shame in not understanding. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. And the enemy would try to take that and convince you there is something wrong with you. And therefore, this isn't for you. It can't work for you. It's good for all these people, but not you. And what it wants to do is it wants to count as common the word that's being taught so that you don't see value in it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that it can lead you away from it. Like one of the, the people in the parable of the sower sowing the seed where they they are led away. By the cares of the world yep. or by the deceitfulness of riches of the world, mm -hmm. right? They're led away from the word. And so that's the point I would make. Every single person in this room at one time or another and probably many times over again didn't understand. Mm -hmm. and in fact, what I want to say is the chief of all people who, who didn't understand is me. And actually, I'll speak as a fool now because I don't know that this is written in the scriptures, but I almost want to say the person who struggles to understand the most is the person who ends up seeing the most. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they keep talking with God about what they don't understand, <laughs> which is all I did. That's the only thing I've ever done was I continuously engaged with God even when I didn't understand, even when I was confused, even when I was angry, even when I thought nothing was happening, even when my engaging with God looked like, I hate you. Uh -huh. You're still engaging with God. Yep. <laughs> Even when you're engaging with God is, you fail. Your gospel is worthless. You're still engaging with God. You think I had understanding when I was telling God those things? I promise you, I was as far away from understanding as a person could be. Mm. But you know what I was doing? Engaging with him. Yep. Yeah. In my confusion. Right? And so it's not about what do you understand. It's about walking with God. Yeah, he is funny. understanding. And it's like... Just like you come to, to, to learn, like Lisa, when we'll use you guys, when you met Thomas, you didn't understand Thomas. I still don't. <laughs> but you understand him more. You understand some of his reactions. You understand some of the things he does, right? And as you I walk, do, and I love him as you walk, as you walk with God, she was warned about me. <laughs> you start to gain understanding. Because he is understanding. And so the That's point right. is to keep walking with God. And even when you understand, you still need to be reminded. There's no doubt. Like just, yeah. I think for me, it's like, well, if I really understood this, then I wouldn't be feeling this way. Or I wouldn't be, this yeah. wouldn't be coming out of me. Or you wouldn't need God anymore. Yeah, every day. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't need God. You're supposed to get there. You know, yeah, or like, you just think that you're supposed oh, well, to, like, get somewhere. the contradiction. But that's not a sign that yeah. you lack or that you're not fellowshipping with the truth just because you you just need to be reminded. That's right. And we yeah. Barb and I were talking about yeah. that this morning and then we'll we'll wrap it up. The idea that we can feel confused, we tend to judge that as a sign that we're back to point A. <laughs> like it's a linear we, thing. We hadn't gotten anywhere. How could I be feeling this still? Right? And and that is a, the conclusion of the carnal mind. And what I brought up to Barb was Jesus on the cross. You think he didn't hear the confusing voices? You think he didn't hear, feel the weakness? You don't think there was confusion present there? Right? Well, does that mean Jesus was now back to point A? Because he felt all of it? No. Because he heard all of it? No, he wasn't back to point A. He's God. And God felt it all and heard it all. The only difference between us and God in that situation is he didn't judge himself. He didn't say, this must mean I never understood the Father. <laughs> this must mean I haven't gotten anywhere, which is what we tend to do because we we conclude that we're supposed to get to the place where we never feel weakness anymore. We never feel sadness anymore. We're never grieved or bothered. We never feel confused anymore. That's where we think we're supposed to get, right? But that's not where we're trying to get, right? Where we're trying to get is to where we just see the Father there all the time, whether we feel confused or not. And in the place of confusion, what happens is, Abba! Right? And you connect with God. That's where we're trying to get. But we tend to judge the feeling of weakness or confusion or despair, even despair, discouragement, frustration. I must not be walking in the yeah. truth. Right? <laughs> I must not have ever heard, you know, and you judge yourself a heathen. <laughs> right? Instead of realizing, no, I'm in need of being continuously stirred up by way of remembrance. That's why it actually says the Holy Spirit was poured out onto us to intercede in our hearts in those moments. The best tagline I ever heard from a commercial was for a birth control patch. <laughs> and it applies here. 
It's not hard to remember. It's just so easy to forget. Nicholas told me something when he was home for the holidays. We were talking about being anxious and, um, I, I don't know, maybe not understanding. He goes, well, just let that be a reminder that Christ, I'm, I'm probably parroting you probably think, Christ is doing a work in you. Yeah. Every time that you, you're yeah. going through that. So I, I, it made me think, oh, yeah. Every We're time anxious. Christ is doing, be, that's, that, be thankful because that's Christ doing a work in you. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually in the scriptures. Paul talked about he learned to rejoice yeah. in his weakness. Oh, yeah. He also said that every time he felt weakness, it was a reminder to him that the excellency was of God and not of himself. Yeah. When our mortal bodies, just to put science to it, when our mortal bodies feel weak and anxious, the reason they feel that is because they inherently know they can't produce life. Yes. Exactly. And they start to feel the effect of it. Because I promise you, an immortal body doesn't ever feel anxious and it doesn't ever feel weakness, no matter where it finds itself. And so it's a sign that God is the one who has life. And you start to make a different judgment, to Lisa's point. That's a powerful point. You start not judging the anxiousness as something negative. Right? right? It, it can even serve as a reminder. That God can even be made strong in my weakness. That's what Paul said. When Jesus said, my grace is your sufficiency, not whether you feel strong or weak. Because Paul was thinking, if I feel strong, then I'm strong. And if I feel weak, then I'm not strong. But Jesus come and said, um, I'm your strength. And whether you feel weak or you feel strong, I'm your sufficiency. Right? Amen. And so then Paul rather rejoiced when he felt weakness, knowing that God would be made strong, yeah. right? right? Because it served as a reminder to him that the excellency is of God and not of himself. So now he starts looking to the God who has life in himself. And now he starts being animated with that life, even in the midst of feeling weakness, yeah. right? The weakness of God is stronger than the strength of a man. How do we know? We see the weakness of God on the cross. Right. And there he is conquering death. When I am weak, he is strong. That's right. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Great stuff. Thanks, guys. Wow. That was yeah. awesome. <laughs> You know, the, old, so the old man's times. always busy <laughs> trying to <what>, push off, <laughs> that protect itself, <laughs> <that. laughs> and trying to avoid it. <laughs> but we're born of a life that says, I'll go jump in the middle of it. Yeah. Oh. Oh.